Hello. In my today's session, I would like to take you to the jury guest and tell you about the role of the concept of data virtualization in the artificial intelligence in machine learning projects. So my session will consist uh, of two parts. The first, we will, uh, I will show you a um, small deck of 10, 15 minutes just to explain the concept of data virtualization and really how you can leverage the power of data virtualization platform on every single machine learning and artificial intelligence projects that you're running in your company. And then for around half an hour, we are gonna run a, a, a live demo where I will show you how to execute a sample uh, AI project using the data that are virtualized with our Denodo, uh, uh, Denodo platform. So with that, let me start my presentation. And first of all, I would uh, uh, I would want to speak about um, this uh, kind of a sentence that uh, whatever AI or ML projects we are doing, we really need the data. The data is the foundation of every single analytical or data scientific projects that we can run. And you can, uh, at the screen, if you take a look at the screen, you can see the different uh, frameworks, different verticals, different industries, and uh, different kind of uh, artificial intelligence projects that we are doing for those verticals. And every single project requires a lot of data, the data that are completely different, data coming in real time from the sensors, the IoT devices, from the click streams, stuff like that. And we need to also combine those data with the static data sitting in a like relational or non-relational repositories inside of our organization or outside. Let's take as an example, the predictive maintenance, a very popular AI use case at the moment when we can get and analyze the data coming from sensors that we place inside of some complex machinery, starting from the airplanes and some uh, my, uh, big mining trucks, and maybe some other machinery that is like a, uh, produce metals, for example. And so the idea for us and the, the task for us would get the data sets, the data that are coming, the real time measurements from the temperature sensors, from the electricity sensors. Maybe we can also measure the some environmental uh, parameters like humidity, mm, all that stuff. And also we need to combine the data with the, with the static historical data, for example, with the maintenance history, with the supply uh, chain database, with the suppliers of the spare parts. Without combining the data from all those different data sources, we cannot really get our job done well. And if you take a look at the typical data science workflow, what we can see, well, living apart the business uh, uh, discovery and uh, the part that we need to do first to understand what we are doing in a nutshell, right? When, when we clear about that, we need to go and pass this kind of six steps. First, we need to start our data mining, we need to identify, find, get, and ingest the data useful for the particular use case, right? The second step for us would be start cleansing those data, removing the nulls, improving the data quality, data consistency, removing the outliers. Then we can go and analyze the data and to understand if we need all the information for our project or we need some, some other data also, we need to include some more data. Then we go so the next step is uh, uh, which is a features engineering we start preparing our data sets for the certain features to be feed into the algorithm and to get that algorithm trained only when we have all this done we can go and start our predictive modeling start trying to train our data sets using this or that algorithm using this or that feature combining them playing with them and finally when we get to the acceptable results, we need to visualize the, um, our result. The thing here is that really that famous 80% of the time, it goes to these four initial steps and goes to finding and preparing the data. Only 10% of the time goes to analysis itself and another 10% of the time goes to the data visualization. What I'm trying to uh, understand here is what would be the solution for data scientists? How would we 
uh, if we would live in the ideal world, how would that look like for the data scientists? And my um, vision here that this is what is needed by the data scientist, a search string, a string where they can just type anything they wanna get access to and receive the data set that they need. Meaning that we need an instant access to everything without really need to store and copy anything. And you know what? Data virtualization is exactly the technology that does what it says on the screen. We do provide the instant access to all information, whether that information is inside of the organization or outside of that. And we do that in a virtual manner uh, without moving physical data from point A to point B to yet another data repository. Let me speak a little bit more deeper about data virtualization. So to visualize this concept, I will show you the, uh, the following slides so that you understand how it works. Whenever the request is coming from any kind of a consumption tool, like a reporting application or analytical application from your Python script or your Zeppelin notebook, the data in real time extracted and combined from the underlying data sources that are connected to our platform. And for us, it doesn't really matter what kind of data source is that. Is it a static repository where we store some unstructured data, or is it a relational database, or is that Excel spreadsheet or CSV file, or that might be the real-time data sources like Kafka topics or message queues. For us, it doesn't really matter. We got all those data, we unify those data on fly, we can improve the quality of the data and we combine them into the schema that was requested by the consumer, uh, realizing indeed the concept of schema on read. So virtual data, they don't have a kind of a certain data volume, predefined data volume or predefined model. All data appearing in our platform only when you query them, when you send in the request to provide this data. If you take a deeper look at that, you can see that the, uh, the advantages of this approach is a uh, zero duplication, so we are not moving the data. And also we provide a real-time reflection of the source data in this virtual layer. You go deeper and speak about the architecture that is uh, basically typically built on, based on the node data virtualization concept. It's kind of a data services data microservices if you want architecture. So all the data repositories, the physical data stores that you have in the company, like your relational, maybe the data warehouse or relational databases or some operational applications can be connected to our platform as well as any kind of a NoSQL repository like a, a graph DBs or time series DBs or um, key value pairs. Unstructured data sitting in your Hadoop environment can be also also a source of data for a platform. It can be the data in Excel uh, spreadsheets that are not integrated into either of those repositories. We can connect them directly to the platform. It can be some cloud applications. Also the data that has a, a real-time nature, the streams coming from sensors, IoT devices, the click streams, the web logs, whatever you want, we can connect to those and build out of all this physical data sources, the virtual data domains representing a certain entities, like for example, a customer, the product, the party, the weather, anything you like, it can be extracted and combined from the underlying data sources in the way that it would be presented to consumers in a unified abstracted manner. Also at the same level, we are providing a granular security. You can really manage the access rights to those virtual data sets uh, um, properly and impl implement the role-based access model here. Uh, you can apply some dynamic data masking rules or you can hide a certain portion of the data uh, depending on the columns, the, the rows or the data itself in the data set. And finally, we are providing the universal truly polyglot access to those data domains for the consumers that can be anything starting from a simple business intelligence, all the way through predictive, prescriptive analytics, AI, machine learning, data science, alerting applications. The data are provided in a form of the traditional SQL interfaces like GDBC and ODBC, as well as the same data available over the API calls or on GraphQL, all data interfaces, all 
these virtual data domains, they're readily available for the consumers and they always uh, uh, represent the real-time reflection of the data combined from different uh, physical data sources. A very important part of here is the in integral integral part of our platform is a self-service data catalog where a single place where any kind of a data scientist uh, an analyst from business can go connect and from the single screen see all the data assets that we have in the company and preview them um, export if needed trace the lineage uh, put some categorization and tagging on the data sets this architecture represent, uh, represents the concept of data fabric that is basically designed to stitch together historical and current data across multiple data cells to produce a uniform and unified business view of the data there's the quotation from the from the market analysts from the companies that are deep into the data management like the, the data warehousing institute for example in the latest review how to get more from the data uh, this is the architecture that we implement based on the data virtualization concept and data virtualization platform that uh, Dinoda proudly provided to you. Now let me go to the demo part and I will in real in real like time I will show you how you can execute your ML projects much faster leveraging the power of Dinoda platform. Let me go to the use case now. This is the city bike in New York, very similar to, for example, Karim bike that we can see a lot in Dubai nowadays at every single corner. So basically the idea that everyone can come and rent the bike for a ride, uh, paying by the credit card or also the mobile app or buying the seasonal tickets and stuff like that. And my idea is to predict the utilization of the bikes. Uh, my idea is to understand whether I can predict the usage of the New York bike system based on the data from the previous year. And luckily, those data are readily available. As City Black provides the very detailed, of course, unpersonalized, but very detailed data about the utilization of their bikes. Every single trip is uh, saved and documented and exposed on this website that everyone can go and download. And the data in that site, uh, the can be downloaded, they, uh, they contain the information like a uh, trip duration in seconds, start time, day and time, the start station, end station, station ID, bike ID, user type, gender of the rider and the year of birth. As you can see, data is unpersonalized. And uh, I went there and I downloaded the, the files uh, containing all this data, I will show down to you later and then I started thinking what else what kind of what are the other information that would be valuable for me for my uh, predictive analytics if I want to predict uh, the rights the number of rides from the station from, from the next year and obviously the first that came to my mind was that uh, probably I would need the information was a certain day was a holiday or not was it a weekend or was it a national holiday in, in the US? I feel like that could matter for that because what I can see from my window in, in Dubai, the Korean bikes are used much more during uh, the holidays than during the working days here. And for that, I need to get this kind of information about the national holidays in the, in the US. And luckily, I in the data warehousing world for quite a long time and I already have um, something that we call in our ter uh, terminology uh, daytime dimension, the Oracle table that contains all that information already, including whether a certain day was a holiday in the US, including the number of the day in the year, number of the day in the months and stuff like that. That data I already have and uh, that data I have in the format of Oracle table my local Oracle database. Then the next idea, what, what to consider, what can be the influential factor for number of rights in a given day. And of course I came to this idea because the weather can really impact the utilization of the bikes. Uh, people don't really ride the bikes in the snow or when it's heavily rain. For that, I had to go and find the data in the National Weather Service of the US 
and those data is also available and I would be able to get the hourly measurement of the weather, um, some weather parameters in, in New York uh, and those data they look like uh, the temperature in, the, in a given hour, the participation, uh, whether, what kind of weather was that, what was the wind, what was the wind direction, I will show you the data as well. So I think that three data sources is enough for me. And what we are going to do, we are going to connect to that data sources that I have in a different format stored on my laptop. I will show them to you shortly. I will format the data, I will prepare them and I will unify them and so that you can, you can really look for the significant factors. And then you'll start combining those data and, and slicing and dicing and turning them up and, uh, up and down, left and right, try and try to understand what are the parameters uh, have to be the input for our machine learning algorithm. Uh, after that, we need to feed the data to the machine learning functions and you, you need a, any tool that gives you this kind of ability. I'm using the Python and I'm just reading those data, final data sets, the train, uh, the train data set from Python. I'm running my machine learning algorithm and then I'm reading that this data set also exposed by it's not a platform, is the Python. And after that, the algorithm gives me the prediction and I compare the real data from year 2020 is the historical data from the gap from the year 2019 and I can see how accurate my algorithm is. After that, I need to somehow uh, to visualize the results. This is the steps that I'm going to do and let's kick off. All right. Here we go. Um, I've downloaded my data from the city bike site and I have them here. Data are coming in the form of a zip files and inside the zip file we have an Excel spreadsheet that containing all the data. I just I will show you what's going to happen if I try to open this uh, Excel spreadsheet and you will understand why I cannot use Excel for this. Uh, it's a great tool but for this particular project I absolutely cannot use uh, the tools like Excel just because the volume of the data is prohibitive. Here you go. It cannot load the file completely, it loaded some. million plus records and then Excel said that I can't digest anymore. It stopped. I cannot even see the data. I can't even filter them here, right? So this is one of my data sources. And as you remember, I have the data coming from the year 2019 from all 12 months. And I also got the data from three months of year 2020 as my test data set. The second data source would be my Oracle table, which I have already a long time ago. I had it for the different reasons, but this is how the data look like in Oracle. This data, time data dimension, it, it contains the date, it contains the all the like numeric information, like a num week number, the month number, the quarter number, the year, in the numeric format, in the month and day, and also, it has a flag whether it's a holiday in the US or not. This is the flag that I need basically from this. Another source for me would be my weather data and the weather data I downloaded from that site that provides the data about daily and hourly weather in New York City and I'll show you how the data look like.
this is this is the day number this is the month number the day number the time when the measurement was taken the temperature in fahrenheit the humidity the wind the speed of the wind and stuff like that i would like to take the temperature as one of the input parameters for my algorithm so that, uh, that is my data and now i want to show you how quickly and efficiently i can integrate cleans and analyze this data utilizing the Zenodo data virtualization. This is the main interface of Zenodo data virtualization platform for the developers. I'm signing into that. And I have my machine learning project. And the first step that I need to do, I need to define the data sources. And I have created three data sources for the city bike data for the weather data and for data dimension from oracle database you can see here if you take a look at the parameters how easily i can onboard the data into the data virtualization platform i don't even have to unzip them i just put in the template here containing the dot star if you remember the files coming with the city bike data coming in a format like a 2019 slash one slash two slash three for the months i can digest and ingest them all in a single uh, shot i just need to specify this kind of a template and i can click the button and the data is compressed what not is going to do is going to get all the data from all those files you union them all together unzip them first of course and all that operations will be done without any involvement of the human being in this case i will show you how the data is exposed in zenoda in a while for oracle i have my typical jzpc connection that is points to my local oracle database or 1521 this is a schema and for the weather i have it also i point that to a certain file and based on this information about the data sources i start building my virtual data model the first step for me is to build so-called base views base view is the one-to-one -one representation of the data from the data source once again to rem to remind you data virtualization platform don't move the data we are not moving a single byte of data we are just connecting to the data and extracting them in a virtual manner and visualizing them in a unified manner on very this user interface so that all the data can be already decoupled from the, the data formats data types the dialects of sql language stuff like that so i created five base views two for the city by data and now i can see that the data is coming here in this kind of format in the tabular format this data was extracted from the zip file then from excel spreadsheet and then all those 12 excel spreadsheets was were joined together and for us it doesn't matter that the resulting data set is like a multi-million record data set you can see you can work easily with that another base view would contain the 2020 data for city bike as well and at the, every single step of the your know, data uh, virtual data model and you can run execution and you can see how the data look like and those are the data for the year 2020 the same let's go here Also, I split the data for 2019 and 2020 for the weather as well. And that is how my data look like. It's coming from the CSV files so the column names. I don't have the column names here. And same data coming from the year 2020. And this is how I represent the data that are coming from my Oracle database this kind of format so we have the first layer of virtualization when we converted all the data into the virtual representation 
So this is the level of abstraction that uh, gives you the representation of the data in the same data formats, in the same form, even visually they are the same. So now we can start working with the data, not even thinking of the data technology that is sitting behind that. And my next step is to create so-called derived views. Derived view uh, is the view based on the base view. But for Denodo, it really doesn't matter. You can build as many levels of the data virtualization as you wish, because at the end of the day, they all virtual. It will not affect the performance anyhow. You can build five, six, seven, ten layers of your virtual data model. At the end of the day, it will all those like layers will be transformed and to the very efficient queries to all data sources to gather data in, in real time. So let me see what I did next. I started a little bit of data cleansing, a little bit of data rank here. So from the, if you take a look at the, the base view, I got a lot of data here and most of the data I don't need actually for my exercise, right? So I created the derived view of city bike data and they're only keeping the timestamp. I'm keeping the year, the month, the day, the hour, the day of week, because that would be interesting for me also to know whether the number of trips from the certain station will depend on the day of week. And they keep the right duration here as well, just out of curiosity. I'm not doing any data transformation at the moment, but you can uh, at every step, uh, okay, and I'm filtering the data because I only want to take the data from one station at, at a time, right? I took the most you know, popular the uh, bike station in New York, which is station number 285, somewhere near the Central Park, I believe. This is the only, only kind of the transformation I did. I filtered the data and I just removed the fields that I don't need. Same exercise I did but with my weather data. I've created the derived view that contains only the data that I need. Again, that's a timestamp and the year number. Here I did a little bit of more like a uh, data transformation because I had to calculate from the data. I had to take the, num the month number, the day number, the hour number, and also I took the temperature. Okay, so this is how my data look like for the weather and for the data dimension, I didn't really do much because I had all data I needed. I only left the data that I'm going to use really. Again, that's a timestamp, the number of the year, months, the day, the week, and as a, the day's working day or not. Now I have all my data very well prepared. I need to now go to so-called analytical views when i'm starting to combine the data coming from all those varial various data sources and then start joining them and start looking at data from this angle or another angle trying to understand what are the factors that will affect the number of daily trip the must through that and you can do whatever data preparation here you can for example the simple one, I can calculate the average number of the trips taken in the bad weather, when the weather was bad and when the weather was good. And I'm getting this result here that really I can see that, yeah, well, it does, it does, the number of the trips, it does depend on the weather because in the good weather, people did more than 14 rides on average every hour. The weather was bad, it was fine. And also, the same way I've created the views, the average data on the average uh, bike utilization per day of week, per hour, per day of months, per duration, per just months, comparing the working days and the holidays. In order to do that, I can use the inbuilt functions and techniques inside the nodal like a filter and I can get rid of some data if I don't like them. I can execute the group by, I can join two tables with a certain parameter. I can add and change some 
calculated fields or aggregation fields like I can put the aggregation here to find out the average trip number and I can convert my binary data about the weather into the readable format like good or bad if it's zero it's good if not it's bad once I've done all that and this is really a, a very simple exercise when you have all your data abstracted from the data formats you can join the tables from different formats in a simple drag and drop and click manner let me show you for example this one should be a good example. Yeah, I'm just joining two tables and then I'm, the node automatically creates me the joining condition. I can go here and I can change it if I wish. Usually I don't. You see this inner join and you can choose and change the join method. It's a fashion method join if you really want. Mm -hmm. So once I have all those analytical views created, I need, I want to switch to another user interface and for that I will, I'll be using the, uh, the node Zeppelin, the notebook, that uh, data scientific notebook, that is very good and simple tool to visualize uh, and analyze visually the data that we just got prepared. For example, I created this view inside the node, which is the average trips per duration. I grouped all the trips per duration and I running this query from the you know, the Zeppelin notebook and I visualize them in the form of this chart. So what I can tell from that, I can tell that yeah, well that seems to be okay. My data is pretty normally distributed. It supports some distribution, so there is no uh, trips with the negative duration. However, I can see the very long tail to the right. Uh, I can see that Maybe I can cut the data right here. I can put the filter and only use the data with the duration of the trip less than one hour just to get rid of the outliers if I want to. So far, I'm not going to do that. And also, I created, for example, you can visualize data in this kind of way. Uh, this is the chart that represents the temperature every hour, the temperature, and the number of the rights taken. You can get some idea already if these two curves uh, correlate or not, and I guess it's probably, yeah, they do. The higher the temperature, the more rights taken, and so on. So this is would be that good parameter for me to feed into my machine learning algorithm. Let's see. I can visualize the number of rights depending on the months and they can see that yeah people tend to drive to take the bikes more in like September and May whereas in January the utilization is quite low I will use the parameter too let's see if it depends on the hour of the day definitely it does so at 4 a.m there's hardly any and the mostly the most busy time is 6 p.m. Not surprisingly, it's rush hour. People coming, I'm going home from the office. Also, I can see that it hardly depends on the day of week. Surprisingly, it's a little bit less on Sunday, but other than that, it's pretty even. And also, it doesn't really depend on the now the day of months. Well, the 31 is not in not presented in every single month so that's this is low but other than that well anyway this is the pie chart representing the proportion of the trips uh, the rights taken on average in the bad and good weather if you remember we seen that in our you know the platform just to remind you this is this this analytical view that I created, and you can see what we are doing basically here in the, the node of the notebook. It's just visualizing the data. I'm running again the query to the node of the platform using the absolutely standard SQL language, selecting these two parameters. And this is dependency on the average 
number of the rides taken on the working days and on the holiday. And they consider it's quite different from Dubai, right? So people riding the bikes more on the working days than on the holidays. Okay, I will take this parameter too. What do I need to do now? Uh, now I need to prepare the data sets for my machine learning algorithm and I need to have two data sets, the test data set and the train data set. The train data set I'll be using to train the model and the test data set I'll be using to test if my model gives me the right predictions, the accurate predictions. So what I'm doing here basically, I'm a, joining the data from three places, uh, three places, three different data sets. I'm taking the timestamp, the number of the year, the number of the months, the day, the hour from my city bike trips data, as well as the trip number, the right number. I'm joining that with the temperature, certain hour, whether what whether was that a bad weather or good weather, and also I'm adding here the day of the week and the holiday flag from my daytime dimension. I say it gives me, yeah, looks good. What can I do here? I can very interesting functionality of another platform on every single uh, virtual view you can run and collect the statistics the statistics give you the metadata the kind of uh, results of the profiling of your data set it tells it gives you the number of the rows for, first of all so it's eight, eight thousand plus rows that's fine but here you go this uh, this values are very interesting i can see that my months is from 1 to 12 which is good the day number is from 1 to 31 which is good again and so on the hours is right, weather can be only zero to one, the day of the week from zero to six. So there is no bad data in here. My data is accurate and they don't have the news, by the way. I'm very happy about that. This is a data of a good quality. Also, I can see that there is no like obvious outliers in the trip number. Because if I saw the minus one or one million here, that could be definitely something to take a look at. Because then we're uh, talking about uh, data accuracy rather than about anything else, and my temperature is also in a very pretty, pretty normal you know, limits. Same way, I'm preparing the test data set. The test data set contains the data from Jan January, February, and March of the year 2020, and it looks the same. It should be the same, actually. And now I'm ready to start my machine learning exercise. For that, I need to use any kind of a tool that gives you access to the uh, machine learning algorithms, the libraries I'm using Python in this case, and the SKLearn library for the machine learning. Very simple script. I'm just acquiring the data from the node or running the simple SQL queries like SQL. I select start from my train data set and select start from my test data set. And then I'm feeding that train data set to my uh, random forest regressor algorithm. Then I'm, after the model is trained, I'm doing the predictions with the model based on my test data set. And then I'm comparing the results, finding out the average error. The, importance of the features okay we can execute it it's going to take a little bit of time but let us see okay my data is loaded now now the machine learning algorithm algorithm started to start to do its job and training the model and making the predictions and then comparing the predicted result with the real result from january Mar february and March year 2020. Let's wait on the results here. Okay, it is ready. So my mean absolute error is 1.12 and my accuracy is 79%, which is not bad already, to be honest with you. And I can also take a look at what features are most 
important for the algorithm and would, uh, not really important. So the most important features are number three and five. It's an hour of the day and the temperature, not surprising. I can try and get rid of the least important features around the algorithm. Uh, this is already the when the real work for the data scientist starts. It's uh, I'm not gonna uh, train in Python or like which algorithms to choose for this sort of use case and how to tune and fine tune the algorithms. Uh, I just want you to. Uh, see the whole process right and for me it's enough and by the way the last step of this python script is to move this data in the in the csv file the the predictions and the real data the hour so that i could connect to them from my the node data visualization platform and visualize that this is the results of my exercise As the timestamp in the form of a day, a month, an hour, and the number of rides that this was predicted, and the actual value in the year 2000. So if you see, that's pretty close, but to make it simple, I can go back to my Dinovisible notebook and I can visualize the data in the form of this kind of a chart. There are two basically curves on the chart, but uh, as you can see, my prediction is actually pretty accurate. Uh, the prediction is a uh, light blue and the real data is a dark blue. They're only showing the data from January here to make it look more, to be more specific, more focused. Well, in some cases, my prediction was really wrong. In some cases, it was excellent. There's definitely a way to go and improve the algorithm. But to be honest, I'm happy with that. This is something that I can go back to my boss already and say that my algorithm is pretty accurate and we can do. We can predict the, what's going to happen, how many rides will be taken from a certain station of my city bike. And based on that information, we can do the business prediction. We can plan how many bikes we need to have at a certain station and a certain day of the, uh, and having the weather forecast for tomorrow, for, for the next week, we can really predict a lot of uh, very valuable business information. All right, now let me switch back to uh, my deck and I will um, just to summarize, let's speak about the key takeaways. And basically, the Node platform makes all kinds of data readily available in a real time manner for any kind of any style of consumption can be the data in relational, non-unstructured, structured data in a static format or data coming in a real-time manner. All those data can be made available in a single place by the node platform. Data virtualization as a concept, it, sh it shortens the data wrangling phases of analytical M or ML projects. You really want to avoid writing those data preparation scripts in Python, R, or stuff like that. You don't need to do that anymore. It's easy to access and analyze the data from the tools like, for example, the Nodo, Nodo Zeppelin notebook that is, again, an integral part of our platform. And you can utilize another platform to share the results of your analytics with the others. Once your virtual data set is ready, you can share it with anybody in the organization who has enough access rights to them. And with that, I would love to just conclude my today's session with a quotation from my favorite scientist, Albert Einstein, who said that we cannot solve all problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. With that, I switch into Q&A screen, and I hope you have some questions from the audience now. 